So I'll do a little bit about KTN because KTN is new. It used to be 14 or 15 different KTNs and now it's just one. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about science. Um, and the paraphrase for that is why there's no point in food science in relation to health anymore. Uh, but <coughs> doing that quite literally. Um, and then I'll come back at the end and say why KTN is such a good idea in the context of what I'm going to do. And briefly in the middle, we're going to talk a little bit about epigenetics and um, 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 oh, cognitive decline. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> so what's a KTN? The KTN in UK is innovation network. Our job is to bring together businesses, academics, funders, to develop new products and services, and to help people to, to make money, really, capture maximum value for the big ideas. And we work very closely with the Technology Strategy Board, which is now called Innovate UK, and I think there's an Innovate UK secret follow-up, and then we'll also be able to tell you a little bit about their current program of work. And I'll touch on that at the very end, what the latest issues are. Um, and how do we do this? We're strategic, <coughs> interdisciplinary, entrepreneurial, and commercial. And in between time, we also do world peace. Um, but I mean, seriously, we do, our, our job is very much to connect people who we usually meet, to solve innovation challenges, bringing businesses and people together from different environments. And I'll explain why we can do that better now than we have done in the past. For those of you who knew about KTNs before, you'll probably recognize all of the ones around the, the outside of that central field. Chemistry, materials, nanotech, high level manufacturing, digital economy, biosciences, agriculture, etc., etc. Those were all independent companies up until the end of March this year. So at the end of March this year, we were all out of a job. And then on the 1st of April, we were all miraculously re employed into the new KTN Limited. And we, we live in four, in five domains material world, living world, applied world, etc., etc. What that means is, in practical terms, is that we are much more joined up than perhaps we were in the past. So if you have an issue, if you have something that interests you about, and you think the answer may involve a bit of and it may also involve creative industries, design, space, etc., you can come to anybody in the KTN, and we'll be able to put you in touch with the right person or people who will then help you to find the contacts outside or either from academics or industry, and we'll also be able to help you to leverage some funding for it as well. So that's really what we do. <coughs> so we're independent, professional, knowledgeable, and I hope we connected. And uh, this is a picture of the Ford Road Bridge, which I'm sure you all recognize. Well, actually, it's the Golden Gate Bridge in California, but it could be the Ford Road Bridge because of all the clouds. And I believe that innovation, we talked a little bit about it, I believe innovation is connecting the seen and the unseen to provide a good picture. So it's connecting research and technology to business and technology benefits, through knowledge acquisition and transfer, Importantly, to create wealth, because um, as has been noted earlier on today, if you don't have a business, then you're not in business, and you can't influence things. But also, knowledge. And this knowledge, wealth, and access runs two ways. You create wealth to create knowledge. You create knowledge to create wealth. Opportunity areas outside of the UK, the TSB and the UK programs, the sort of things we help with are things like EU framework programs, other EU programs, bilateral collaborations, industrial collaborations, and we can help you in interaction with other NGOs as well. <coughs> okay, let's move on to diet and health. Epidemiology, bias, and clinical trials, or lab, the lies, damn lies, and statistics, or PhD theses, take your pick. I want to talk a little bit about diet and health. This is Pito, I'm sure you're all aware of it. Beautiful quote from him. Epidemiology is so beautiful and provides such an important perspective on human life and death. <coughs> an incredible amount of rubbish is published. In some of it, a large proportion of it is in peer reviewed journals as well. I'll give you an example. Dr. Flegel, an epidemiologist at US Center for Health Statistics, published a paper quite recently suggesting that actually having a little bit of extra weight is not a bad idea. <laughs> Um, Walter Willett, who's probably one of the leading nutritional epidemiologists in the world, uh, who's based at Harvard, said, this study is really a pile of rubbish, I'm not going to time reading it. I can't do Walter Willett's accent, I'm sorry. I lived in Chicago for a while, but he's, he's from Maryland, I think. But that's nothing like a bit of scientific objectivity from a real scientist, and a very well renowned scientist as well. And I'm going to pick on Walter a little bit, because, well, because he's so well known, um, and, and therefore it, it, he's, um, 
He kind of sets himself up sometimes. So I'm just going to pick on a few other things which suggest a lack of objectivity, not necessarily by him, but by the epidemiology area. Another report, um, and this is quoted in Forbes 2013, a particular study has been promoted to the media as showing a link between aspartame and cancer. The truth isn't sweet when it comes to artificial sweeteners, said the best release. The truth was that the statistical findings were really weak, and you couldn't really support the claim. And there's been a lot of systematic views on aspartame. Every time somebody complains to the EU about it, they have another systematic review. Um, the study had been rejected by six journals before getting into the AJCN, where Willem to member of the editorial board, and he said, I do think this finding is strong enough, enough to justify further study on aspartame and cancer risk. So you have, you have to have selective vision on this one. You've got to ignore the fact that statistical findings were so weak and confusing that such claims would be supported, because he thinks there should be just further study on aspartame and cancer risk. <coughs> However, he also said in 2010, talking about a, a range of other studies that have been conducted, that results of case control studies were overly optimistic and any association between intake of fruit and vegetables with the risk of cancer is weak at best. And this has come up again at the AACR meeting, American Association for Cancer Research meeting in 2014. For prevention of cancer, the primary focus of present should be heightened efforts to reduce smoking and obesity. I'm, I'm with him on this. I think the evidence is there. I'm not quite sure that obesity in the US has become similar to smoking as an avoidable cause. Uh, I, think, I think we're talking about differences of orders of magnitude here. However, I think the point about uh, association between intake of fruit and vegetables with risk of cancer being weak is, is a very solid statement based on the evidence that's out there. <clears throat> so reductionist efforts, and I'm a chemist, I'm a reductionist, um, but I'm doing the 12 steps. Uh, but the reductionist effort to pin the blame on one component of a diet, whether it's high fat or low fiber or any other aspect of the diet, leads us all astray. It's, it's the sort of thing that we tend to do, and we want to get things down into bite sized chunks so we can understand them. Okay. <coughs> Elizabeth Whelan said perhaps we can now stop demonizing various foods. The strongest link again between diet and cancer is between obesity and cancer. But that's based on excess calorie intake, not whether one, whether one eats broccoli twice a week. And I'll come back to broccoli. Are you confused? I certainly am. I lost 30 pounds on the reduced joy, joy diet. What about portion size? This is, I think, Belgian portion size. <laughs> <laughs> Each of these glasses is one unit. I lived in Brussels for about a year. Um, but there's a more serious point behind all of this. And it really is a point that a lot of nutrition and a lot of food science and a lot of things that try to break things down so we can actually understand them really deal with reductionism. It's about breaking things down into components that you can understand. Systems biology is all about interrelationships and dynamics. And it's hard and it's difficult and it's a pain to do, but that's where we've got to go. We've got to go with systems biology. We've got to understand the interactions and the interrelationships. We can't just take a single thing and say, okay, if you eat lots of that or if you put that into our test system, then it's going to solve all your problems. That's reductionism, and it doesn't work in the context of diet and health. And I'll come back to how it does work in medicine uh, towards the end and explain why KPN is important in that context. <clears throat> so, is eating broccoli good for you? Well, here's a bit of chemistry. Glucosinin is nice for Chinese, but also you felt that this meeting was really missing some chemical structures. Um, the is the thing at the top there, and down the bottom is isothiocyanate, and these are some of the examples. Some of you may have heard of sulfovaphane. That's the compound that's really been pushed as being in broccoli, which does just about everything. And I'm going to come back to it in a minute. I, I don't really believe some of the hype on that. But essentially what happens is that glucosinates get broken down to produce isothiocyanates, that's responsible for the pungent smell and things like mustard, and it's responsible, those compounds are also responsible for much of the health benefits. What sort of biological effects are people proposing for all isothiocyanate? It's a small slide, I don't expect you to read it unless you're uh, majoring in, in um, systems biology or molecular biology. But epigenetic regulation, inhibition of NF kappa beta, antibacterial effects, after correction of history, etc., etc., etc. Et Does synegrin, which is a parent of glucosinate, and allyl isothiocyanate do all of these things? It certainly does. Does it do it in real life when you and I eat broccoli? Probably not. 
So what we've got to understand that just because you can tick a box in a test doesn't mean that thing is biologically relevant. So this is going to be back to some work that I did when I worked uh, in Wrigley. I was director of scientific discovery. I was looking at this question of isothiocyanates, and I, I realized I mean, I've, I've been playing around with these for quite a, some considerable time. The reaction at the top is isothiocyanate, and there's a thiol next to it. If you write the two of them together, you get something called a dithiol carbonate, which trips off the tongue. The two compounds in yellow, methylmercaptan and hydrogen sulfide, those are the main compounds responsible for bad breath. So that eureka, aha moment was when I was sitting at my desk on Christmas Eve in Chicago, because I didn't have any friends then, so I only just moved. I thought, if we take mustard oil, which is isothiocyanate, and we stick it into chewing gum, we'll have something that gets rid of bad breath. Problem, mustard oil is not a really good flavor for chewing gum. Um, however, actually what we found was it works. You can put mustard oil into chewing gum at such a low level that you can't even taste it. It actually enhances sweetness at a low level. And it cures bad breath for two hours. I can talk about all of this because it's been published and it's also um, it's all, also a part of it. I'm not sure what you said there. So it works. It is, it is a nice idea. And it's nice and simple and it's molecular. Now then I started thinking, well, Maybe we could look at this a little bit differently, because these dithiocarbamates, um, this reaction, which we just picked going one way, it actually goes the other way as well. It goes backwards in cellular systems. So a dithiocarbamate will actually break down to give you hydrogen sulfide. Why is it interesting? Well, it's interesting because hydrogen sulfide has got a whole pile of physiological effects. Hydrogen sulfide is a new nitric oxide. It's a phenomenally active molecule. So the thought occurred that maybe, maybe some of these effects could be useful. And maybe dithiocarbamate, which are formed from the isothiocyanate plus hydrogen sulfide, could be storage form of hydrogen sulfide. Biological effects of hydrogen sulfide. Anti-cancer activity of new design of hydrogen sulfide donating hybrids. Well, the dithiocarbamate is actually a hydrogen sulfide donating hybrid. That's what it's doing, is storing hydrogen sulfide, put it in the cells, and it releases it. Great. I won't go through all of these, but particularly activation of NRF2 and modification of KEEP1 those are both activities which are associated with the broccoli isothiocyanate, which is quite interesting. So there are similarities here between the biological effects of hydrogen sulfide and the biological effects which are claimed for sulfuropane. There's the second line, second from the bottom there, there's actually some mechanistic stuff. If anybody's really interested, I, I'm prepared to bore you at lunchtime with a little arms to go all the way that explains why some of those isothiocyanates will be more, about, more active than others because of the way that you bind up hydrogen sulfide. So, could sulfur obtain another isothiocyanate simply be a way of storing H2S in the biological system? We don't know yet. So, let's move on to epigenetics and neurodegeneration. Um, so this, this comes back to this idea again. Is we've got to understand the mechanisms if we're going to be able to make claims. Here's two, two fairly unrelated papers. Epigenetic blockade of cognitive functions in the neurodegenerating brain. And then analyzed dysinates of cancer chemo and What do these have in common? Well, both in English, that helps. <laughs> um, the important message is the one at the top. It's about acetylation. What the first paper says is that if you can, and this is, this is the epigenetic thing, so think of the histone. The histone is just a, just a chunk of cellular machinery, and it's all tightly wound up. If it gets acetylated, that means things stick onto it, acetyl groups stick onto it, and it gradually pulls apart. And what that means is gene regulation goes up because all the molecular machinery can get into the gene then and turn it on, so you get gene regulation going up. So, acetylation is actually a good thing because that increases gene expansion and in, in neural cells which are beginning to degrade, increasing that gene regulation means you get more products and they work better. You're going to have to take my word for this because I'm not going to get there. Sondrine will explain this to you later. <coughs> so, what we're saying is that if you've got lower acetylation, the whole system gets really tight again, the gene expression goes down and you get greater cognitive decline. So just remember, lower acetylation, greater cognitive decline. Okay. 
what does the ITC, I'll analyze the taxonomy do? It actually stimulates histone acetylation. And, um, yeah. okay, these are in cancer cells, so it's not exactly the same, but nonetheless, it's a living system. And what happens then is that they're actually, um, what, what allyl isothiocyanate does, it stimulates histone acetylation, so it actually reverses this lower acetylation, greater cognitive decline. It turns around the other way. Greater acetylation, lower cognitive decline. Take home message from this is, you could snort mustard powder, and it might actually make you think thicker. It'll certainly make your eyes water. <laughs> um, but, I mean, this is a semi-series point. There is actually a, a reasonably rational hypothesis for this. There's a molecular basis where you can do it. What we're now talking about is, how do you deliver mustard oil or analyzer thiocyanate to the brain? Um, and that's the bit I'm not going to talk about, because that's covered by patents quite quickly. OK, so we're just going to wrap up now. And I've been talking a little bit about what you can, what you can prove and what you can't prove. And I think cognitive decline is, in many ways, far more important for us than increasing obesity. Um, we're all going to suffer from cognitive decline. Um, so I would suggest that's, a, that's a, a more important target for some ways. What is the difference between diet and health and pharma? Is there a difference between the time taken for the effects to be noted? I mean, if you're, if you're really ill and you take a drug, then you get an effect. If you're going to get um, uh, type 2 diabetes in 30 years' time, you can't take anything at that moment that's going to solve the problem that you can then stop taking. It's a continual process. So is it a time bound? Is it chronic rather than acute? Is it related to dose? Is it small, le low levels of five chemicals, for example, compared to large levels? And is it really about loss of function rather than just gradual deterioration? And that's some of the questions that we still don't really deal with. Um, and it's one of the questions that I think the KTN can help with. So what can we do? We work at interfaces between areas and disciplines. We try to stimulate positive disciplines we want. And in this particular area, we're looking at things like preventative medicine. Now, preventative medicine can mean things like the polypill, which I'm sure you've all heard of, where you have statins, aspirin, and two other things which I always forget. Probably one of them is to help the cognitive decline. Uh, in the one pill, and you take low level, a low level pharmaceutical every day, and it reduces the levels of cardiovascular disease and heart attacks and stroke by a significant percentage. So that is a, that's a polypill and it's directed. And that's one aspect of preventative medicine. Another aspect of preventative medicine is the sort of work that's going on in a number of places uh, across the UK, which is very much. Um, hypothesis led and hypothesis driven, the sort of work that goes on at the Rowett, um, where they're talking about trying to understand how you can modulate diet and have a long-term effect, but not forcing people to eat stuff that they really don't want to eat. It's more about getting an understanding. And once you understand that, understand, once you understand that, then you can optimize. And it's all about joined up technology as well. And what we can do as a KTN is we can try to find and influence funding decisions in the UK and Europe. That's not to say we can can influence them, we can try to influence them. And we can try to respond to need. And the need, and I'll take you way back to the beginning, the need is not just to improve people's health, it's not just to do the fundamental research or to help with that fundamental research, it's also to create wealth. And that's part of what, a major part of what we need to do as a KTN is to help UK companies create wealth. Because if you have wealth, then you can do all sorts of other things as well. <coughs> right, I'll just briefly touch on this because I think uh, your speaker tomorrow from Linnea UK will we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. Technology is five innovation. It's a new call that's just come out. Key features investment of about two million in feasibility studies to stimulate innovation in certain areas. Opens 10th November, closes 21st of January. And it's, the call is in these sorts of areas. It's very, it's very good. It's great because it's, it's, it's got those interrelationships. And they're really keen on proposals which will bridge these different areas. So it's but the the real positive thing is coming out of Innovate UK and has done all the time that I've known them and TFB part of that is they are very interested in this cross disciplinary wealth creation opportunities for wealth creation. Um, so this is the sort of thing that they're interested. Characterization and discovery tools, production processing, things like metabolic engineering, novel manufacturing processes, tying these sorts of things together, getting some fundamental science in these areas, which are maybe in adjacent areas. It may not, chances are it might not be good science and good chemistry. But it's going to be in areas which are going to be potential, have the potential to really leverage opportunity. And bioinformatics. 
uh, which is lots and lots of numbers, uh, which being up again, this I don't really understand. So, health and well-being with the KTA. If anybody's got any questions, I don't know if we've got time to take a quick one just now. Um, and if not, then I'll be around uh, or drop me in. Absolutely, and that's why you spotted it. It's a very, um, <coughs> it's one of these things where, well, there's that, and there's that, and whoops, look, look what that is not wonderful. You're absolutely right. Um, mixing up cancer and neurodegeneration is a very dangerous thing to do. And, um, but what we do know is that the acetylation story works in, in neural tissue, and it doesn't seem to have any effect on, neural, uh, on brain cancer, for example. So it's in a very specific way it is. The example I pulled out of how the same similar sort of mechanism seems to happen in cancer cells with that particular allylase and isanine, I admit I was using that for convenience to show the principle that it might work. Um, but I agree with you completely. You cannot just um, you cannot just cut down on uh, sorry increase acetylation and assume the benefit's always going to be good. It's far more complex, <coughs> particularly in cancer cells, as you say. 